This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Thousands came to know Josh Radner as Benjamin Braddock in the Broadway adaptation of The Graduate. To millions of others, he was Ted in the CBS series How I Met Your Mother, which ran for nine, count them, nine seasons. Now still, millions more are coming to know Josh Radner as Jedediah Foster, a physician captive along with other doctors and nurses to the horror of the Civil War. The series is Mercy Street, widely praised for its attention to historic, to include medical detail. It's been renewed for a second season and can be seen here on AETN on Sunday nights at 9, beginning in January. Josh Radner lectured at the University of Central Arkansas recently, and since we're just next door, we lured him across the street for a conversation. Josh Radner, welcome very much. Thanks Thank for having me. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, it's good to be here. Were you, uh, let's start with this current project, were you a Civil War buff before this began? No, but I'm the son of a Civil War buff, as most people are. I feel fathers tend to love the Civil War for some reason. I didn't uh, actually get the bug until I did the series and, you know, plunged into research. And it was really fun because I could call my father and say, you know, why didn't McClellan move on, you know, the army? Right. <laughs> He'd say, because he was a coward, you know. he. Uh, he, he'd always been a big Civil War fan. I remember in whatever, uh, 1990 or so, when the, the Ken Burns documentary was on, I remember my parents watching it every week. Um, but it just, uh, it, I, it never took hold in me until I threw myself into the research. And now I would say that I'm quite the Civil War buff. Yeah. Well, and, and you're an Ohio native, so you grew in Ohio, was in straight, Ohio forces instrumental in the yeah. Union Army, so you had one suspects an abundance of material at hand, or at least that you grew up absorbing. Yeah, but again, until until I was cast in a project that required all that information, right. I, didn't, I didn't, it wasn't that I, I actually, <clears throat> a couple years ago I read a terrific book that my friend wrote uh, called Lincoln's Melancholy. Uh, Joshua Wolfshank is his name, and it was about uh, Abraham Lincoln. It was, it was looking at the life of Abraham Lincoln through the lens of his depression, which was by all accounts crippling. And he had no medication. He had no uh, a kind of modern treatments. And his theory, Josh's theory, is that he used uh, this depression to fuel him to 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 take on a larger mission, to, so he wouldn't be crushed under the weight of it. So in that, this was about five years ago. I read that book. I I thought, wow, I I don't know as much. I know about I know high school levels. Uh, you know, I actually took a class in college, but I my my Civil War information was very basic. Um, but reading that book and then being on this series has opened up all these avenues for me. So, Your extensive experience in commercial television uh, speaks for itself. Now you're shooting for a, a series which airs on public television. Is there a different ethic at work or ethos anyway, a different approach? I think so. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things, uh, even just the term commercial, you don't have commercials versus having them. And I think uh, certainly the way they structure shows uh, they structure them around act breaks. You can feel when they're driving to uh, a somewhat of a cliffhanger or a big joke on a on a show like How I Met Your Mother, so that people stick around through the commercials. Um, uh, I think you're seeing a changing, uh, very rapidly changing landscape around what TV is, how it's watched, uh, consumed on different platforms, with commercials, without commercials. Um, so, I think um, also. Uh, they left us alone a lot on How I Met Your Mother. In some ways, we were getting, uh, at the beginning, we had good enough numbers that they left us alone to make our weird TV show. Mm -hmm. And then by the time they kind of started paying attention to us, we were already a big hit, so they let <laughs> us be. So you know, but uh, 
Mercy Street, we, we've had so little network interference. The one thing, you know, PBS would say, does it have to be that disgusting? And they would say, well, it is the Civil War and it's an amputation, so it's hard to make it, <laughs> you know, it's hard to sanitize it. Right. But uh, largely, I know creatively, the, the producers and writers have felt uh, an enormous amount of freedom coming from the network. One of, uh, as I mentioned at the, in the introduction, it's really won some of the respect of a lot of critics, acclaim even, for its attention to detail. Yeah. You, could, you, you got it right, is what the critics are saying, yeah. in terms of the practice of medicine, battlefield medicine, or, yeah. or wartime medicine. Yeah. Well, they, they, from the moment of conception with the show, they, they brought in experts, and they were sending them off to, you know, every script was vetted uh, within an inch of its life for accuracy. And uh, um, I know also the, 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 the Civil War crowd, uh, I've heard, is quite pleased with it. And they, they, they know more than anyone. I mean, they, they're the first to cry foul when something doesn't uh, line up. So I know that, um, you know, this, th that's obviously not my area of expertise. I just trust them. But uh, we had a medical expert every step of the way, you know, the way we're suturing wounds and uh, the, all the different, um, you know, blades and saws I mean this is all this is all stuff we had to learn there wasn't interestingly there there wasn't much to learn in some ways you know when when the way the the, the bar to becoming a doctor in that time was incredibly low there just wasn't that much knowledge right. to acquire um, and uh, you know after I had done this amputation scene <clears throat> I went to a museum with Mary Elizabeth Winstead who plays nurse uh, Mary on the show and there was a, a list of you know this is how you do an amputation in the Civil War and I went I know all of this. This is exactly what I did. You know, the stick, it's a six step process. And I was like, I could do it. I mean, it'd be messy and I'd faint, but I could do it. Yeah. yeah. It isn't true only of Mercy Street, but it's true especially of Mercy Street that in this Civil War tableau scenario, the battlefield isn't the battlefield. It doesn't right. involve muskets and it doesn't right. involve, or, or, or explosive cannonball grape shot. Yeah. It involves conscience and ethics uh -huh. and the conflict of personalities and sensibilities. Yeah, that's well put. Yeah. One of the things um, Lisa Wolfinger and David Zabel, who created the show, they, they wanted to do a Civil War show. <clears throat> and they realized at a certain point that the budgets have to be extraordinary for, for battle sequences and thousands right. of extras. So they thought, well, what if we found another locale where everyone comes after the battle? which is a more self-contained kind of petri dish, which has all the great uh, you know, dramatic tension of both the time and about just being in a hospital generally. And uh, one of the things I also love about the show, it, uh, it, feels, it feels both modern and, and, and historic all at the same time. You, uh, this is one thing Ken Burns talked about that he loved about the show was it, you know, we had, they had irony, they had humor, humor as a coping mechanism in the darkest of times. And the show, if you, if you pay enough attention, the show's quite funny. You know, there's, there's <laughs> little, moments. there are moments, yeah. and some of it is quite ghoulish, the humor, but, yeah. but you, you see that, Gallows um, humor. yeah, yeah, and, and I know MASH was a big influence, this kind of, you know, in wartime, how do we cope, and, um, but I know that, uh, yeah, they, they, um, they, there, there was something, inherently dramatic about the, the and, it, and you're only going to see it get uh, worse the, the, the longer the show is on, the worse and bloodier the battles get. So one of the tragic and slightly haunting things about the first season was everyone kept saying, well, the war's going to be over in a couple weeks. War's going to be over in a couple months. And this is May of 1862. You know, yeah. they, they had no idea what was up ahead. So you can, I've read, I think, four of the scripts. So you start seeing the, the influx of bodies uh, just gets more and more. They're not prepared for it. Interesting metaphor you just used, petri dish. Hmm. Yeah. For developing, seeing what culture's there. I yeah, know. I always think of drama that way, that you, you, you kind of start with a solution and you drop different elements in and see how they combust or not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, especially when you have something like a hospital, it's self-contained, and then you, you, you know, there's a couple new characters coming in, so you drop them in, and how, what does that do to the, the ecosystem? I'm mixing metaphors now, but, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, and then to make that process work, it certainly has so far, the director and the producer have to allow you as cast members, actors, you ha they have to allow you a certain measure of freedom of interpretation Yeah. to allow that dish to really culture. Yeah, well, a lot of it's on the page. <clears throat> I find if something's well-written, 
um, and you find the, the angle of approach that is aligned with what's on the page with, mixed with your own kind of take, your own rhythms, your own, or your, your own um, just interpretation, you kind of filter it through your own, uh, your nervous system. And, and uh, you know, you, you start off and you, you have a slight handle on it, but every day the guy starts seeping in more and more. And it becomes, you get the new scripts and you just know kind of how to behave. Yeah. And you know where the parameters are. You know when you've gone too far. You know when you need to goose it a little bit more. But it starts to become just this natural expression. Is that method, Mr. Redner? No, I don't think so. That's not what I'm trained in. I'm not... Uh, I don't make everyone call me Dr. Foster on the set or anything, and I'm not trying to relive trauma when I was younger. Um, one interesting thing, uh, the character started to feel very familiar to me as I started playing him, and I thought, I've never played this character before. Why does he feel so familiar? And it occurred to me that he was feeling like uh, Dr. Astrov in Uncle Vanya, which is a play <laughs> that I've done twice. And I asked David Zabel, the creator, I said, were you ever thinking of Uncle Vanya and Dr. Astrov for this character? And he said, no, but it's one of my favorite plays, and now that you say it, I know that it's in there because sure. he's, a, you know, he's a he's a country doctor who, uh, you know, is a little more sophisticated than the other people around. He's a drunk. Uh, my character has a morphine problem. He is an idealist whose whose cynicism is kind of uh, overtaking him, and he doesn't want it to. He's very bewitched by women, which my character is too. So they're they're just uh, you start noticing that you've you've actually been training to play a role without even realizing it by having done. I did it in grad school, and then I did another smaller one, uh, you know, a couple years ago. So it's a character I've loved and a play I've loved, and I realized, oh, I'm I'm kind of doing that on TV now, which is really fun. Well, you've you've you're working in big screen as well. You've done two, uh, directed two movies, yeah. Right, right. And, well, you appeared in one. I appeared in both of them, both. actually. Both, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I, I regret yeah, that. Yeah, no problem. You, so you've worked in, on stage, small screen, large screen, Yeah. preference. Well, I feel more at home as an actor, most at home, in the theater. There's just something about, that's how I started. Uh, it's like, you know, it's like a fish in the little baggie and you drop them into the bigger ocean. You know, they, they, it just feels like my natural habitat somehow as an actor. I know the scale of it. I know how to get what needs to get to the back row to the back row. Um, and you're in more control. No one's editing you. No one's, you know, you're not, you don't know, no one's shooting you from a certain, you know, it's just one take. You just do it. That said, I feel <clears throat> like I'm learning more and more how to be on camera. And that's a real thrill. Uh, and I feel like I learned more in the three months of doing Mercy Street um, about camera acting than I'd learned in quite some time. The sitcom world is a little more theatrical and it's a little broader. So I never felt like I, I mean, sometimes I felt, but I never felt like I was exploring the outer limits of subtlety on How I Met Your Mother versus, <laughs> versus uh, Mercy Street where I really feel like I can, I can play in a totally different way. Did it become restrictive? Uh, the series, the mother, uh, How I Met Your Mother? Um, a little bit. I, you know, there's a certain skill set that they keep going, a certain well they keep going back to. Just because of the DNA of your character and how it fits into the, the, the show. Um, so I felt, I've, I've used this metaphor before, but I felt like I was going to a gym every single day, but I was only allowed to work out my right arm. So the right arm was yeah. just really impressive looking and the rest of me was kind of withering. And my director, Pam Fryman, she told me that at the beginning. She said, you're not going to get everything you need from this show. So you're going to have to do other stuff that's going to fulfill you artistically, creatively, spiritually. So that's why uh, I, always, I always suspected I would write and direct, but it came about a lot quicker than I thought it would just because I needed to exercise these other muscles. Well, it, along those lines, would it benefit every actor, small screen or large, to go back to the stage or to go to the stage? I think so, but that's my Regularly, that's yeah. my home. Yeah. You know, that's that's where I feel. Uh, there's a theater uh, up at Vassar called New York Stage and Film. I've I've worked there since college. I was an acting apprentice there. Every seven years, they have me come back and do a play, and it's always when I need to do a play the most. They they call me and they offer me a play. It's right when I need to get back to the roots and f remember who I am as an actor. Um, but I think also, um, you know, if they're in for a close up, like you're really just acting from here up. On the stage, you're always acting from your toes to the crown, always. I mean, everyone's seeing everything. So you, it's a more immersive experience. Um, 
And I think it's I think it's I think there's nothing better there's no better actor gymnasium than the stage. Or physical, I would imagine, no. too, on a consistent basis. Yeah. No, and uh, you know, some people though are real creatures of film and they have a hard time getting up on stage. They're like, Oh, we're doing this again. You know, live, they're, they're I mean live I mean, and no it's no terrifying take. and they're you know, but that's just where I uh, it's where I feel still to this day, I feel most at home as an actor. Well, uh, you, you work on both sides of the camera. Yeah. You like working on both sides of the camera. Mm. Which do you like most? You work at the keyboard. You work behind the camera. You direct. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, people always want me to choose, and I feel like I, I love this kind of renaissance thing. You know, I'm, I, I wrote a play recently. I'm writing a book. I uh, have other films that I've written. I intend to keep acting. So until someone makes me choose, <laughs> I'll just uh, keep doing all of them because I really do enjoy all of them. Yeah, well, you've got a good menu. Yeah, it's. I, I feel. I feel pretty fortunate. Yeah. You said once that you the, the the projects that interest you, and I assume not only on paper or on the, nowadays on the screen, but uh, computer screen, but as a performer, and presumably as a director, involve big questions. Hmm. Explain that. Something that you you yeah. have to wrestle with. It yeah. Or well, enjoy I think that's more. It probably is true as a writer, if, I mean, as an actor, if I really looked into it. I mean, certainly, Mercy Street, the big question was, I don't know if I can play this part. That's enough of a big question to do it. Because I find, and it's a bit annoying, but I find that um, you only move forward if you scare yourself sufficiently. That if you throw yourself into something that you don't know if you can do. That's the glory is on the other side of that, because then you realize that you're capable of more than you thought you were capable of. As a writer, if I go in with answers, I'm probably not going to write something all that great because I'm being pedantic or writing a kind of polemic. Uh, but, <laughs> but if I go in with a bunch of questions, I go, I don't, I don't know. Like uh, liberal arts, um, uh, the second film I wrote and directed, we, we, it was set at a liberal arts college. We shot it at the one I went to, Kenyon College in Ohio. And uh, I had gone back to show um, Happy Thank You More Please, my first film, uh, and I was 35 at the time, and suddenly all these uh, students were calling me Mr. Radner, and it, and it, it, it uh, alarmed me because <laughs> I was suddenly I was an elder, right? Yeah, I was yeah. I was, a, and I and I thought, guys, I was just here, like I was just here in my in my mind, but I was I was older, considerably older, and I thought, wow, uh, you know, if a 35 year old guy fell for a 19 year old sophomore, that would be a complicated situation. And I told my producer that, and he said, that's a great movie, write that movie. So I just had a scenario, right? I didn't know what it was. I just thought, guy goes back to his college for his favorite professor's retirement dinner, meets and falls for a 19-year-old sophomore. As I wrote it, I started to understand what the movie was. It was about time and aging and nostalgia and the purpose of a liberal arts education, the limits of a liberal arts education, uh, the, the reasons we read books. Can you read too many books? Can can you be too in your head? You know, what's the consequences of being too in your head if it's not married to heart? I mean, all these questions started to bubble up, and I was able to work through them in the writing of it. It became not a May-December romance, ultimately. It became about this larger kind of cosmic issue about maybe what it means to be mortal and what it means to be a thinking human. So um, I didn't know all that when I started writing it. I found all that out. And then if the questions are big enough, it feels like, yeah, I can spend two years working on this. If they're not big enough, it's not, it, it, there's not enough uh, um, stuff there for me to chew on, you know? You found out from liberal arts. What did you find out? What did I find out? Yeah. Um, so these uh, seemingly existential questions. Yeah. Well, What's it all about? Yeah, Instead. I mean, it became about, b both the movies on some level are about accepting change. And all the characters, and again, I didn't know this as I was writing it, it only, I looked at it and realized every character is somewhere they don't want to be. Whether they want to be older, younger, not there, uh, you know, uh, yeah. they just wanting to rewind the clock, fast forward the clock, everyone is dislocated and, um, uh, not content with where they are. And um, it just kind of became about being here, you know, being where you are. I still to this day have to remind myself that this right now, this conversation, is the only thing that's happening in my life. There's nothing else that's happening in my life. There's water, there's you, there's cameras, there's lights. That's it. 
There's <laughs> nothing else happening. And to me, when I can remember that and feel my feet on the ground and know it's, it's, it's the antidote to anxiety because anxiety is either, you know, either we're in the past feeling regretful or thinking the past was better or we're worried about the future, you know, or thinking of something in the future is going to save us. And, you know, there, there are larger spiritual questions ultimately. And those are big, those are questions I'm interested in, but they, I work them out in narrative because it's, it's my, it's my thing, but also, um, I, I smuggle those things in, you know, liberal arts looks like a romantic comedy. It's not a romantic comedy. It's a, it's a much bigger thematic, uh, souffle kind of, but, uh, but I put it in this form that looks like we know it, but I think that I'm trying to, I'm trying to explode it from within and, you know, I call it Trojan horsing. You know, you smuggle something in, you know, when you explore these, these, when you're trying to resolve them in your own life, yeah, seizing the moment, carpe diem, whatever. Uh, what, do you, what do you use? Uh, they're spiritual questions. You, yeah, you describe them. What's the tool that you use? Uh, I meditate every day. I've been meditating since I was two th uh, since 2003. Um, I feel like the mind, especially now, I don't. I don't know. It's hard to check in with people 500 years ago, but it feels like the modern mind is is very, um, it's just always moving. Hamster. Yeah, and we're uh, the the way we're connected now. It's it, we're we're constantly going, 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 and and um, I feel like just to have a time where we get quiet every single day and and about non doing because we're so much about doing and effort and meditation is about non doing and and effortlessness and to encourage those qualities even for 20 minutes a day. It can be revolutionary just to get your mind quiet. And then other things start to come out that are beyond the mind, you know, intuitive uh, things start to kind of bubble up. So meditation is the biggest thing for me. Um, just, you know, I walk outside my door and I can hike up to a lake, you know, in my neighborhood. So I do that hike quite a bit, just moving my body. Um, Music is very important to me. Classical music is a big part of liberal arts. Um, I've fallen in love with classical music in the last couple of years, but I listen to a ton of all kinds of different music. Um, anything, anything that can uh, remind me where I am, that I'm, that I'm here, and then uh, and I and I write quite a bit. You know, I wake up every day with the intention to write. It doesn't mean I always get to it. Holy cow! But uh, <laughs> but I sure that's you know my D, a big part of my DNA is writer. And uh, and I and, and when I have a good writing day, it's 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 kind of an antidepressive thing for me. I, I feel if someone calls me and says you want to go see a movie, and I've had a good writing day, I say yeah, let's go see a movie. You know, I yeah. don't feel I don't feel like I'm playing hooky yeah. if I've done it. Yeah. Well, uh, you 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 bring to mind another quotation for that, that I read of you. You once said that I th you think I'm a, I'm a little less hungry than I used to be. Are you less hungry or less satisfied, or are you satisfying the hunger in a different way? Get I wonder what I meant. I wonder what in what context I meant. Uh, I'm probably less hungry for um, uh, people to tell me how great I am, <laughs> but I'm more hungry to create things and keep doing this. I think I think I feel like I I used to need a certain level of validation or, or I, I, it was almost like doing it for the wrong reasons. And now that I've experienced the joy of the actual doing of it, that's where I get the joy. That's where I get the, that's what feels like, that's where the, the gold is for me, is in the doing. I mean, find me in an editing room, editing one of my movies, and I'm the happiest person in the world. A sound mix, love it. Interesting, yeah. I heard Spielberg in an interview once uh, say well, the, the, the thing he most enjoyed about movie making was the mix. In the yeah. editing room, I mean, where it all came together. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting because you have the picture locked, but the sound still needs work. And then as the sound comes in and you start fixing things that were bothering you, and you can start <laughs> feeling that it's the movie starts to come into sharper relief, and you can feel what you've made, and you can feel with each tweak of the sound, the movie's getting better. And, and it's, it's thrilling, you know. There are people, undoubtedly, that are of all ages, who are watching this program who think, "I can produce, I can act, I can sing, I can write, I can be, I can enter the theatrical professions, at one level or another, or in one, one avenue or another." Yeah. Advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, I, 
when I when I discovered theater, and I discovered it in high school, doing high school musicals was how I started. I felt I felt that I was very good at a lot of stuff. I didn't feel like I was great at something until I stepped on stage. I suddenly felt like this is where my skill set is best expressed, at least at that time. Yeah. And um, I read everything I could get my hands on. I read every play that I could find. I read every theater magazine. I read every interview with playwrights and actors. I read the New York Times Arts and Leisure section kind of religiously. I would, I would find a New York Times in Columbus, Ohio and read it. So by the time I started meeting people in the theater world, I knew who they were. I knew what awards they had won. I have, I have a good uh, kind of name recall. And it wasn't in a oily kind of networking way. I just was really excited to meet these people. Sure. And I saw, I thought, this is a world I want to be a part of. These are, this is a community I want to be a part of. So I kind of, I had this very strong vision of myself as a, an actor in New York City. Now I thought I was going to be a theater actor who did some Law and Order and, you know, hoped for a Woody Allen movie would be, you know, that was kind of the, the top of the mountain for me. But um, circumstances took me out to Los Angeles and, and TV and now I'm, I'm kind of circling back, you know, I, I did a play on Broadway last year for about seven months. So um, I think, you know, uh, there's so many forces that are telling you you can't do it, but people do it, you know. You, you, I had a relative when I said I was going to grad school at NYU and he said, um, well, I hope you're good at waiting tables. You know, you have, you have people that are always going to try to, your family, you know, will try to take you down. Um, but I think, you know, everyone who wants to be an actor is not supposed to be an actor, but it doesn't mean they're not supposed to be in the industry. I mean, plenty of people who go on to do big and beautiful things and started off acting, because that's a lot of our first love. Um, I think being adaptable to change, being adaptable to where maybe, maybe this is a different opportunity that I might find more satisfaction with. Um, being kind, I always say, is like, it's a myth that you have to be a rude person to get ahead. I think that that stuff ultimately catches up with you. And most people that I work with in, in the business are really kind. Peter Garrity, who plays um, Dr. Summers on Mercy Street, said a great thing when we were talking one day. He said, I think 97% of people in this business are terrific. He said, 97%. And he said, you know why? Because everyone's living their dream. He said, every gaffer wants to be a gaffer. Every person in wardrobe wants to be in wardrobe. The actors want to be actors. So there's something satisfying about a community of people that's all doing what their first choice of profession is. Um, and whatever you can do to stay on the side of, uh, I, I always play a game with myself, try to remember how happy 15-year-old me would be <laughs> feeling about like what's going on now, you know what I mean? Um, I always try to click into that place because you have to watch your cynicism and your discontent because we're human beings. We can find a way to complain about absolutely everything. So I always have to watch that in myself and just be, be grateful, you know. Gratitude is um, kind of the antidote to all that other stuff. Josh Radner, thank you for your art and thank you for the past half hour. Thank you. This is nice. Right. We'll see you soon. Yep. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. This program is made possible in part by the Moving Image Trust Fund.